Berry Robinson. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Idaho, and I want to talk to everybody today about a project that's about a year old now, uh, where we make evolutionary video games. And I'm going to, I guess, share a, a few anecdotes about things that we've learned during this project and uh, assumptions that we made that turned out to be wrong, and, and some fun little observations that we've had. Uh, this project got off the ground thanks to the Beacon, so that, that has been really Uh, the project's name is Polymorphic Games, and Polymorphic Games is essentially an interdisciplinary video game design studio at the University of Idaho, where we hire a bunch of undergraduates from a bunch of different disciplines that I'll show you in a bit, and they work together full-time all summer to create evolutionary video games. And the premise of Polymorphic Games is not, strictly speaking, to make educational games. It's to see if we can implement models of biological evolution in games to make them better. So, I'm gonna just play a video in the background and mute it so we don't have to listen to it. Uh, because it demonstrates uh The basic idea is that we are very careful not to reinforce misconceptions about evolution, like individuals can evolve, or evolution requires agency, and that kind of crap. So um, we pit the player against a population of evolving organisms. They impose selection on that population, but they don't make choices. So this is the player, they're shooting these. Uh, this may look familiar to the old people in the room that used to spend most of quarters in the cave. But this is a digital population with digital genomes, all of their traits, like how they fire, how they move, when they fire, what they look like, all that kind of stuff is encoded in a genome, and however far down the screen they get, and however close they come to shooting the player, that's how they accrue fitness. At the end of the wave, it's at the end of the generation. They reproduce in a fitness proportional manner called tournament selection, and the ones that are best able to defeat you are the ones that have the most babies. And so the game gets progressively more difficult, and eventually you die. One of the things that we learned is that evolution makes games super hard. So, yeah. so if, you like, if you like Dark Souls and stuff like that, you're gonna like these games. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's Darwin's Demons, and there's a poster on that tonight if you're curious about it, and you can talk to Sam all about uh, that particular project. It's super, it's, it's super fun and ask him a detailed question. So that's the basic idea. And now I just wanna share a series of slides, it'll be reasonably brief, that are kind of just little chopped up little things that we have learned, and some of them have data behind them, and some are just observations that we're curious about. So the first thing I feel like I need to do is convince you that it is indeed an evolutionary game, and this is where Sam's poster will be a little better. Um, this is one of the splash screens from the Between Games, and we have a variety of fitness functions in the game, and this is just showing you a variety of replicates from the game that this genetic value that we call fire rate, the frequency at which they fire projectiles at the player, if you're evaluating those aliens on the basis of how good they are at that, after 20 generations, you evolve what's called a bullet hell. So anyway, it is an evolutionary video game, and we've actually published, uh, we're publishing a couple papers now in, in evolutionary computation conferences about these kinds of approaches, and so we have a lot of data on this. And it's, it's, there are some weird effects, but it's, it's very good. So it's an evolutionary video game. Um, but the education part isn't what you think. So when I talk about education, in my mind, yes, Players that play our games will learn some things, but we can't control really what they learn. This is the learning. This is the education. These students, I've color-coded them, are from all over campus. Art and virtual technology and music, and we have theater kids doing voice acting, and we have writers, and we have business students, and we have biologists and computer scientists, and they all work together to create these games, because to make a game, you need all of those people. Terry, my colleague and I, the computer scientist and the biologist, tried to make a it was a hilariously boring simulation, right? Then we got the artists involved and it became much, much more compelling. So um, 
and our university, actually we get a lot of support from our university because we're giving experiences to these students that are pretty unique and fun. So. Um, and these are super awesome students. Uh, all right, so education, informal learning. Uh, this is a space cow, and the video is doing weird things, but anyway, uh, there it is again. Uh, it's an evolutionary game, and we took it to a high school, uh, a little LAN party that a university hosts, and um, we had a high school competition. And university students are smart, and they were like, hmm, an evolutionary game, you say. And they immediately began to exploit the model, and they would shoot all of the threatening creatures and leave the really dumb ones to live a long time, and the dumb ones would just drift over to the side of the screen and just sit there, and they would farm them for a while, and then they would go on to the next generation. And they literally domesticated these things and got they won the high score competition by domesticating our alien. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Space Cow is a video game. That's not gonna sell well. So <laughs> as an educator, I was thrilled. And as a game designer, I was like, we need to nerf that strategy right now. So we actually have to take the lifespan and fitness component out of the game. Because otherwise it's 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 like farm bill in space. <laughs> All right. All right, outreach opportunities. I don't know, I'm gonna to wait to see if there's any tickers of amusement here. So this evolution news, most of you probably don't read this. <laughs> because this is actually the uh, uh, misinformation arm of the Discovery Institute. The, um, I don't wanna be mean or anything, but the, the dumbasses, you know what <laughs> Right? So they actually picked up our game. That's, oh, we're reading. Sorry, dumbasses. <laughs> so this guy at Baylor picked up her game, and he was mad at us. And then the Discovery Institute picked it up, and they wrote an article, and they're also mad at us. You know why they're mad at us? So we created, and we build it as an evolutionary game. And they're like, no, 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 no. The creatures did not evolve sentience and learn to play Mario Kart. Literally, those are the words in the, their article. Therefore, evolution is a lie. So they're mad at me because my undergrads in the summer didn't program Skype. <laughs> right? Like, okay. Anyway, so uh, anyway, that was quite hilarious. But uh, I wanted to get into a hilarious Twitter war with them, and all of my colleagues were like, "No, no, no, no." Yeah. And I thought it would be hilarious. But anyway, um, we do tons of outreach with these activities to high school students and middle school students and stuff like that. This is one such activity. Guess what that says? Holman Christian School. Your move, Discovery Institute. This young woman was actually assigned to help me at our booth. And, and she was really, she's so bright and so great. And then I was like, well, we made this evolutionary video game. And she says, uh, I'm, I'm a creationist. So, and I'm super proud of myself in hindsight after hearing what John was saying. I said, okay, let's find some common ground. What do you know about genetics? Let's just talk about what we did here. She's like, after a while, she's like, oh, this is natural selection. Oh, I believe in that. <laughs> face palm. Anyway, she was a wonderful person, and she helped me explain the game to a bunch of other kids, and it was super great. I mean, I just loved it. It was a great opportunity to find common ground and, and you know, things we were doing. So, um, now, last year, I talked about this project, and it was just in its infancy, and we, we would always get questions when I talk about this project about, oh, you're making a project for um, uh, teenage boys, good job. Right? And I said, no, no, the rates of engagement in video games between men and women are almost equal, actually. And we think, no, this is gonna be great for, for attracting women and keeping them in STEM and things like that, and no, 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 no. Now, there's some caveats here. So, we have Google Analytics data for all our web presence, and the game Darwin's Demons is available on Steam. For those of you over 35, Steam is the Amazon.com of video games. Um, and so if you're doing web-based stuff and you're not doing Google Analytics, do it, do it. it, it you get so much information that it's actionable. So here, this is our demographics breakdown of engagement on our websites and purchases of our game and stuff, seven and a half percent. Now that might reflect the population that engages with the Steam platform, but we assumed that we would be just making a game that would be equally appealing to uh, girls and boys, men and women. No, no. So we have to do better than that, and so we're working on that. 
Um, these are the demographics, and again, these largely reflect, reflect the demographics of the platform on which we are distributing. All right, outreach. We got the nerd population nailed. We have the <laughs> okay. So Google gives us a tremendous amount of information of the interests of the people that we are attracting and, and are engaging with our game. And it's the usual list. Uh, hardcore gamers, movie lovers, technophiles, dating services. That would be interesting. Um, so this is useful to us because it tells us, okay, we can't just passively throw a game out on Steam and meet the objectives that we have in terms of engagement and broader impacts and things like that. That's a bad strategy. Okay, almost the last slide. Uh, this is kind of fun. Um, we have had interest in this project from all over the world, and we're not doing super well in Africa, and then John had to explain to me what this even was. I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> we who are, are wailing for a living aren't into video games, I guess. So, uh, so obviously we have a lot of impressions, and so these things roughly, the, the impressions on our site and the, and the Seeing of our game and all that kind of stuff is roughly equivalent in terms of these maps. But it's, it's interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, all over the world, um, we're at a university and we always get volunteers that come to the university from other countries who are like, if you ever want your game translated into Spanish, Chinese, whatever other, German, whatever other language, they're happy to do it. And the faculty are happy to help them do it. And Steam allows you to localize your games and so I think that, especially in the United States, for example, Spanish translation, that's a huge opportunity for uh, broader impact and, and those kinds of things. And so these data, uh, Germany, like they're, they're a weird outlier. They love our game in Germany. It's pretty strange. So I, I guess they're very interested in the relation game or something like that. Um, so this information has been, been really interesting for us in terms of uh, planning our next project, which is really what I want to talk to you about now and then leave lots of time for questions. Um, so what we, our approach is to hire a new team of students each summer and make a new evolutionary game, maybe a new genre, kind of try to push our capabilities a little bit. And that so our next game is quite a bit more ambitious and there'll be a poster on this uh, uh, tomorrow. So this is a little video that's gonna play while I talk about it. So this creature that is uh, mutating right before your eyes is the new version of the space game. So it, this is, so Landon is our lead artist, he's in the audience too, he has a poster on this tomorrow. But it's being procedurally generated in game engine with a digital genome that controls a whole bunch of its traits. And I'm showing you this video to just show, and the lighting is terrible and it would wither on the computer screen, but um, I'm, sh I'm showing you this video just to show you the, the level of morphological diversity we can achieve with this technique. So we, we bill it as like a procedural generation of creatures using digital genomes and evolution. This isn't evolution, it's just randomly mutating and just randomly behaving. Um, but we can, we can achieve a great deal of cool variation uh, with this technique. And so this game will be fully 3D and it'll be a combination of real-time strategy, things like StarCraft, and if you're over 35, uh, just relax. Um, and, uh, and with tower defense, like a base defense kind of game. And these will be a population of digital organisms that are kind of over defensive. Um, these little dudes here are also being, uh, they have some very genetic variation as well, but they're <coughs> actually quite like, easy. So, um, and this is the code name. I, I don't know. Is that really not Gong? That's a different Gong. Different Gong. Okay. You turned off the sound. <laughs> John, you were supposed to remind me to turn it back on. That was John. Okay. Anyway, so that's the last slide, and I can just let that play, and I'm mean, hoping there's a few questions. Yes, sir. Oh, that's the power defense. Do you some defense mechanisms? No, we don't. Everybody wants to have a co-evolutionary game, and we are not ready for that yet. Okay. You know, but uh, we're going to actually display the tower defense game at our booth. Uh, starting around lunchtime, so you can, you can have a look and see what's up. Yeah. Uh, 